Welcome, everybody, to Until Saturday. Instant reaction. Jimbo Fisher fired as Texas A&M head coach. He's getting a pretty penny to walk away to the tune of more than $75 million in a guaranteed buyout. This is a coaching change that is not surprising in that it happened. It's obviously been a very underwhelming tenure for Jimbo Fisher as head coach. But for it to happen now, two games left in the season, coming off of a big win on on Saturday, although they apparently did this on Thursday. Uh, big news, <laughs> big change, huge change. This is the kind of move that really sets the coaching carousel off, can change everything that happens over the next few weeks as we get into that season. We even had another change, Boise State, later in the day. So, Sam, you were at Texas A&M yesterday. You know this program as well as anybody. What was your reaction to the news? Yeah, I'm shocked they pulled the trigger now. It, it I expected that they were going to let the season play out before they actually made the move. And talking to a lot of people on campus last night at the game, I didn't get the sense that a change was imminent, that it was going to happen right then and there. So for that, I'll start by lauding Texas A&M's leadership and people for apparently doing a pretty good job of keeping this under wraps the last few days that they had – basically gone from the Regents meeting and, and made that decision. But the fact, like you said, the timing of it was surprising to me. The fact that they did it is not because I'm going to go over a couple things here. Yeah. Since he signed that contract extension, remember 2021, September, 2021, right after their 2020 season, when they went nine and one and they finished top five in the polls. And then their LSU job was potentially about to open, which it later did. And Scott Woodward and LSU definitely tried to lure Jimbo away from Texas A&M in the midst of that search. This They gave Jimbo Fisher a proactive contract extension uh, for the tune of 10 years to almost $95 million, fully guaranteed. That would keep him there through 2031. Since that extension, Texas A&M is 19 and 15. They are 10 and 13 against SEC competition. They are 12 and 14 against Power 5 teams. They are 4-10 and 10 in games decided by one score, including losing seven in a row, which is the longest active streak in the nation. They are 1-9 and nine in true road games since 2021 and have lost nine in a row. They have not won a true road game in more than two years. Oof. And Jimbo Fisher's record after 70 games at Texas A&M is 45-25, which is worse than Kevin Sumlin's 70 games in, which was 48-22. and 22. That pretty much tells you all you need to know when you consider that they had one of the five best rosters in college football. And when you watch them, when I watched them last night, buddy, I can tell you, they look like they have one of the five best rosters in college football. There are dudes everywhere, to borrow a term from our good friend David Oven. There are dudes everywhere, and there's no reason that this team, even with its quarterback injuries, in my opinion, there's no reason this team should be 6-4 and four right now. No, of course not. I mean, they have recruited top six classes from 2019 to 2022. I think they were all top six. The 2022 class was the highest rated class of all time when it happened. And there's been some attrition, but they still came into the season number four in team talent rankings by 24-7 sports, which is basically what's the high school ranking of everybody on your team. And that 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 one stat, no road game, no road wins in two years, more than two years is wild. And it just, it never worked. I, I was at TCU last night with Ari and the tweet with the decoy of Max, uh, Max Johnson comes up. <laughs> and I say to Ari, I would fire Jimbo right now. I say, if, if, this, if, if this program feels like it needs to go to creating a fake Max, Max Johnson in warmups just to throw somebody off, you've so completely lost the pl plot. You've lost <laughs> any chance of this program becoming what it needs to become. So they ended up winning that game. It worked out with Jalen Henderson and all that, but you could tell this was not going to work out and talking to people in the coaching world, the industry, the, the agency world and stuff like that for the last couple of weeks, it was known Texas A&M had the money to do this and they're not giving them $75 million up front as mm -hmm. bio goes through, I think 2031, but it's possible that could be extended out even more could be a Bobby Vanilla type of contract uh, where he just gets paid for a very long time. But yeah, this this was not working and it hasn't been working for a while. And look, what's the difference between 75 million and 66 million? You know, it was only going to be like a nine million dollar difference if they waited another year, which may seem like a lot of money. But in the context of 75 million, 
it's not that much money. And if you think you have all this talent there on the roster and Jimbo's not the guy who can take advantage of it, that's why you make the change. A lot of people said, give him another year. He's done, done a really good job of getting talent there. But the fact he couldn't take advantage of the talent is the reason to make the change. So the next guy can come in and do something with it. Now you're going to lose some of it. We've already seen a player going to the portal already. There's going to be more of that. But this clearly was not going to work. And it, it, it wasn't close to working, really, outside of that goofy 2020 pandemic season when they went 9-1. and one. Other than that, it's it's been nothing, right? Like when you look back at the Jimbo Fisher, era, Jimbo Fisher era, what stands out to you as like big moments? Uh, year one, the seven overtime win over LSU, which was the first time yeah. Texas A&M beat LSU. Uh, they they changed the overtime finish- rules. They changed the overtime rules because of that game. <laughs> yeah, uh, th- they finished nine and four that season, and it was it was a really good start. You could tell that things were starting to change and, and it was moving in the right direction. Then they went seven and five. I think it was the next year. Uh, they, they had a really tough schedule. They played like five top 10 teams that year and lost all those games uh, to those top 10 teams. But uh, the 2020 years when it all came together. And it's funny because early in 2020, things were starting. People were getting a little antsy then because Jimbo's record against ranked teams wasn't very good to that point. They AM really hadn't had a huge breakthrough moment. Then they beat Florida early in that season when Florida was in the top five. It was kind of a statement game, and that triggered them the rest of the year. And they ended up winning the rest of their games and finishing nine and one and having the top five finish. And then from that, it's just been downhill. They went eight and four the next year. Of course, they beat Alabama in that year, but they went eight and four and didn't didn't go to a bowl game because of covid and then last year they went 5 and 7 and it was an utter disaster in 2022 because you had suspensions you had Jimbo flipping through his stack of papers looking like a CPA to call a play and getting plays in late the offense was terrible they they had a run where they weren't scoring more than 28 points a game against power 5 competition for i can't remember how long it was almost a full calendar year that they went without scoring more than 28 points uh, against a power 5 team uh, and so then you saw the injuries obviously hit uh, the offensive line play has been really bad for three years. And then there's structural issues within the program. Ever since they signed that number one class in 2022, they've had a ton of turnover on the personnel staff. Uh, they had to change their director of player personnel at one point with that Marshall Malkow, who is now at Oregon. He left after the to join Dan Lanning's staff because they had worked with Lanning at Georgia. And when he filled that role, he filled that role with Kevin Mashak. Kevin was there for about a year, and then Kevin got let go in June of this year. And guess what? We're sitting here in November, and Texas A&M still does not have a director of player personnel. They have not filled that position yet, which in modern college football, virtually every major program has that position filled. They don't have a special teams coach, and thus are one of the worst special teams uh, teams in the country. They've, I think, 10th, 11th worst in the country in kickoff return average. They've given them three return touchdowns this year, including an opening kickoff return touchdown last night to Mississippi State. Uh, there's all kinds of issues that have been lagging in this program and have just been cracks in the foundation and it all adds up. And so then you can forgive some things if you win, but when you're not winning, when you're not taking advantage of the talent you have, it becomes a problem. And, and that's what happened is that the, 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 the challenge was Jimbo Fisher could bring all the talent there. He's a terrific recruiter. He gets guys, and you see the guys that they brought. They evaluated really well, and they've got a lot of dudes running around. But when you cannot translate that into wins, it is an issue, and there is something lost in translation, whether it's your staff, whether it's your coaching, whether it's your development. Something is lost there, and they were not getting better. And if you feel like giving him another year was going to prove that, I don't see how you could come to that conclusion. We've got the last three years of data which have told us this is what Texas A&M football is under Jimbo yeah. Fisher. And I don't yeah. think it was going to get any better just because you're going to get Connor Wegman back healthy next year. And, and, and by the way, another factor in all that really good recruiting is NIL, which Texas A&M is very, very good at and has been famously good at. Now to the member, this member Nick Saban called out Jimbo Fisher <laughs> saying they bought their recruiting class and Jimbo went to that press conference and called out Nick Saban said, look into his past, look into all these things. That was like the most heated we had ever seen a coach. And no, the idea that they spent tens of millions of dollars to get that 2020 recruiting class was not reality. But 
Texas A&M is doing a very good job in the NIL space and getting money to players. That is a factor as well in terms of Jimbo being a good recruiter and whatnot. They've got good coaches on that staff. I, there, there are three moments, four moments, I'll always think about with Jimbo in his tenure. One of those was that press conference against with Nick Saban when he called him out. Still surreal. I can't believe that happened. Me and Ubbin did a crazy. live room as soon, as soon as it <laughs> happened. The, an, another, when he was caught out on the field during that return touchdown by Auburn earlier this season. <laughs> I, I don't remember forgot if it was about a, that already. I don't, I don't remember if it was an interception or a fumble, but it was a fumble was return. In, yeah. Yeah. Jimbo's out on the field and he has to like move while the player goes behind him and out the sideline. Just a crazy uh, image to, to, to look at. I'll think back to his nephew trying to get in a fight with Kevin Falk after Ooh, uh, that was a long time ago after the seven overtime <laughs> game. Yeah. That was in your one time game that he was there. Cole also Fisher. That, Where are you at? Cole Fisher. <laughs> and, and when Jimbo got the job and they presented him with, uh, they had a trophy for a future a national black. championship. I want to know where that trophy is. I do too. To it. This is going to be the new mystery. I, I did a story last week on the civil conflict trophy and it being found. I want to know what happens to this. Do they destroy I actually, it? It's, fun, it's funny you said it? that because about an hour or two ago, I sent a message to my editor, Eric single, uh, and I said, hey, just a story idea I have. We need to find where that plaque is that, yes. they, that John Sharp gave to Jimbo yes. Fisher because I really yes. want to know what happened to it. Yes. So. Okay. Let's talk about the quality of this job. Um, Sam, <sighs> you wrote a really, really good story this summer about Texas A&M and why it never lives up to its potential. Despite the hundreds of millions of dollars thrown into this program over the last couple of decades, they have not won a conference championship since 1998. They have only won more than nine games once in that span. And that was when Johnny Manziel came out of nowhere to win the Heisman Trophy. This is a program that seems to have everything you could possibly want, all the resources in the world. It never happens. Sam, why hasn't it happened? And do you believe a new coach can make it happen? If you're able to keep the talent that they have now, or at least a good chunk of it, I do think it's possible to turn this thing around quickly, but you've got to, a, you've got to get the right guy, but mm -hmm. B you've got to hold on to the talent because the one thing that A&M has right now that they really haven't had at a high level in the last 25 years that we're talking about is they have not had this level of talent. Like Kevin, someone recruited pretty well. He definitely recruited better than his predecessor, or at least in terms of recruiting rankings, Mike Sherman, I would say Sherman was a really terrific evaluator and got some really great offensive linemen there. A lot of those offensive linemen, they ended up being drafted in the first round and were part of some of those first two teams that were successful. But in terms of overall talent, like by time the by time Jimbo Fisher took this job, someone had recruited pretty well and they had a pretty good roster and a lot of those guys are still playing in the league. But we're talking about Jimbo Fisher recruited at a top eight level nationally, consistently. And so you have a roster that when it gets off the bus, looks like LSU, it looks like Alabama, it looks like Georgia. Uh, so the reason why I think they haven't done it before this, before they had all this talent is a few things. And I, and I talked about it. If you guys haven't read it, look it up, Texas A&M, why, why, why six theories about why, uh, college football would be elites and why Texas, what's Texas holding Texas A&M back. One of the ones that I had cited was the lack of administrative stability and alignment. Texas A&M has had a lot of upheaval in administration over the last two decades you look at programs like oklahoma that had the same president and ad still has the same ad you know the same president changed but for a few years back but joe castiglione david Bourne, and bob stoops were all there from 1999 to 2016 uh clemson has had only two presidents since 1999 and three athletic directors since 2002 Georgia has had three presidents since 88 and four 80s into 79. A&M is now going through, I believe, their sixth presidential change in the last 15 years, last 20 years. And they are, they are right now on their third AD since joining the SEC 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so that's been one part of it. I think it creates a little bit of a power vacuum. So I think that's been an issue. Uh, the head coaching moves and the contracts have not been great. They, they gave Kevin Sumlin an extension early you know, in year two. That yeah. ended up came, coming back to bite him later. That, of course, we know of the Jimbo extension that they gave him. That became an issue. Once upon a time, they gave Dennis Francione an extension in, I believe it was 2005, after he had like a 7-5 and five season or something like that. And I was like, what, what are you doing? And the expectations, even though I think A&M has really high expectations and desires to win a championship, 
they haven't won at a high level enough to where I don't know that they demanded enough. Stephen McGee, a former AM quarterback, brought this up mm-hmm. to me, and he told me, he said, the culture and the expectation internally, not internally in the program, but externally just isn't demanding a greatness. He said, if mm-hmm. there's an acceptance that nine and three is a great year at AM. And I think yeah. there's a validity to that. And maybe this is a sign, you know, making this move now when they did and demanding that the results be better. Maybe this is a sign that they are moving on from that and that they are raising those expectations to where we can't put up with eight and nine win seasons, which they haven't even been that consistent in that front under Jimbo. Uh, But maybe they are moving beyond that. And I think that's going to be the key thing is they have to keep the talent. Number one, get the right guy. Number two, and number three is the expectations have to meet the demands because every other ingredient is there. Facilities, NIL, fan support. Buddy, I was there last night. I was 100,000 strong there last night. As bad as this season has gone for them, two hours before the game, Aggie Park was packed with tailgaters. Everybody's having fun and enjoying it. And you don't see that level of dedication everywhere else. And they have the access to the talent because you're right in the heart of Texas. You're 90 minutes from Houston, which is one of the most talent rich mm-hmm. areas. You're not far from East Texas. You're not far from Dallas. Every other ingredient is there. All you need is someone who can get it done. And I do, do, do think they need to a certain extent, some administrative stability. And I think that is a lot harder to achieve than finding a great head coach. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about the next head coach and who it could be. I'm going to, I'm going to throw out some names here. I'll throw okay. a group of names. Then you tell me a couple that we should talk about more. Mike Elko, Duke head coach, Dan Lanning, yeah. Oregon head coach, Kalen DeBoer, Washington head coach, Mike Norvell, Florida state head coach, Jeff trailer, UTSA head coach, Eli Drinkwitz, Missouri head coach, Lance Leipold at Kansas, Chris Klein in Kansas state. Uh, and there's a couple others. Any of those? What, what what's what's one you want to talk about first? Who who jumps start, out to you the most? Let's start. I'm going to start with the guy I think makes the most sense for this job, but I don't think AM is going to hire him. Is Jeff Trailer? Yeah, I knew that's what you said. I, I think Jeff <laughs> Trailer makes a ton of sense because he, for one thing, Jimbo has done a really good job of recruiting and recruiting nationally, and I think he's done a good job of getting some of the top guys in the state. But one thing that he did early in his tenure was that he fractured relationships a little bit with the high school coaches early on. Yeah. Uh, he worked to you, kind you of and I, by the way, you, you and I, you and I did a Texas recruiting confidential, I think two years ago, mm-hmm. and where we just surveyed in like like twenty Texas high school coaches for what they thought. Everybody loves Jeff Trailer in the state. Mm-hmm. He's a former Texas high school coach, but the Texas A and M reaction was a bit mixed because there's some things he did. So explain that. Yeah, so I think when Jimbo first got here, he one of the things he did early on was he met with a seven on seven coach or something early on and took a picture of him on social media. And it's it really was not a big deal to be honest with you. But Texas high school coaches here are very territorial, and and they took that as an affront. It's like, oh, the first day on the job, you're going to go see that guy. And that same day, by the way, Jimbo went and saw Gary Joseph, who's state championship winning coach at Katy High School, very well known very well respected, uh, had a power position at in the top of the Texas High School Coach Association for a while. Uh, so he went and saw them both on the same day. And I think that the Texas High School coaches thought, well, you're putting that seven on seven coach on the same plane with the high school coach, state championship high school winning coach. And so there was a little bit of a consternation about that. And so political, uh, there's, such a, a, there's a way of like a politics thing it, to happen. It is. It absolutely is. And there, yeah. there's also a level of recruiting here where, everything goes to the high school coach. That's kind of how it goes. And it's not truly how it goes anymore, but it's still how the high school coaches would like it to go. Mm -hmm. And Jimbo kind of just does whatever he needs to do to get the players, which to his credit, it worked in a big way. But I think some of those relationships, and it depends on who you talk to. I think we talked to some high school coaches who really spoke highly of Jimbo. And you talk to some high school coaches who are like, yeah, I don't trust that guy. And I think Jeff trailer would help repair some of that because Jeff, is a former Texas high school coach, and he's beloved by the, all those in the state, like you said. But also, you look at what he's done at UTSA, they have a really good recruiting operation. They don't have a ton of resources. They're punching above their weight class in the American right now. They're, they're still undefeated, even with all the injuries they've had and struggles they've had. And I think you give him the resources that AM has, and I think he would absolutely kill it. 
Now, I don't think Texas A&M will go that way because I don't. I, I think the idea of hiring the coach from UTSA is probably more than Texas A&M leadership can get its head around when you're paying yep. seventy-seven million dollars to tell Jimbo Fisher yep. why. So I yep. don't think they're going to go that route. But I think he'll be in the mix. And if they were to hire him, I think he'd make a ton of sense. Yep. He is beloved in the state. He knows everybody. He knows how to do all the political machinations and everything like that. You get that guy in front of the Texas a and donors, like, it's done, you know. Yeah. But yeah. can you convince people, hey, we're going to spend $75 million, really more like 80 90 to get rid of all the coaches, to hire the coach at UTSA? It's mm -hmm. a tough sell. That's it's that's sell. that's that's the thing. That's that's the thing. Now I'll give you two other names that you not that it's right, but but it, I'm but thinking it's of a sell. yeah, yeah. Two other names is Mike Elko. I think absolutely stands out here because a he's done a great job at Duke so far in his yep. two years there. Again, fewer resources, much tougher situation to recruit than Texas. A he, he's he's fifteen and he took over a three win team. He's fifteen mm -hmm. and seven. He went nine and three last year. Beat Clemson to uh to start this year and he coached at AM for 2018 to 2021 defense coordinator recruited mm -hmm. a lot of those really good players that they've got on their team or that they had on their team um he knows the place now the question yes. i would have is do, do you think you can fire jimbo fisher to hire one of his assistant coaches i mean he he is he was there for the four best years of the jimbo fisher era you know mm -hmm. that, that everything has kind of gone downhill since he's been gone that's not to say that that his departure is the reason for that. That's there's way more factors that go into the decline here the last two years than Mike Elko's departure, but it certainly didn't help. And they had one of the best defenses in the country when he was here. And shoot, they have one of the best defenses in the country now. They, they had a really rough year last year with DJ Durkin in his first year. But Elko knows the place, knows how to recruit the place, and mm. understands the culture. And I think he would be well received by the fans because people generally do like Mike Elko, people who spend time around him. He's he's a personable guy. He and he's a really good football coach. And so I think he would make a ton of sense. And the other name that that stands out to me on this list is Dan Lanning at Oregon. Yep. I think Dan brings the kind of juice. When you talk about young, energetic oh, yeah. guy, that's in the antithesis of what Jimbo Fisher is at this point. Yeah. Dan, you, you think about that speech that he gave before the Colorado game. Like, yep. I think you, you I think AM fans would run through a wall for Dan Lanning. And yep. the question is, does he want to get back to the SEC? What does he think of Oregon going to the Big Ten? If this is a chance to make a move, Dan Lanning, in my opinion, is a home run hire. Oh, and by the way, would bring, probably bring, I would assume, his director of player personnel, Marshall Malikow, <laughs> bring him back, right back to Texas a yeah. and Marshall was part of the number, putting that number one recruiting class together when they signed it in 2022. So I think you could, and, and again, he's been at Georgia. Landing has, understands the lay yep. of the land in the SEC, and what the, you have to do. Defense and coordinator I, there. Defense coordinator there. And I think an understanding of what it takes to win and recruit at a high level in the SEC is absolutely paramount in this job, especially when you consider who's coming, Texas and Oklahoma, who are both programs that also recruit at a high level. So now yeah. you got you got to have guys who can win those battles on the recruiting trail because, as you know, when you go up against Nick Saban, when you go up against Kirby Smart, when you go up against all these other dudes in the SEC – it is cutthroat, and you've got to have guys that can win those battles. And Lanny has done a terrific job recruiting so far. So if if I were thinking what A and M fans probably look at this list, I would think Lanny probably is your number one if you're an A and M fan. Uh, Kalen DeBoer is an interesting one that you threw out. I, I'd be interested to see how people feel about him. He's been terrific at Washington so far, but I think Elko makes a lot of sense. And like I said, Trailer would be a dark horse in, in my opinion. Lanning home run, absolutely. One of my Favorite thing, stories I like to tell about him. The first story I did here at The Athletic was I traveled to Memphis in 2017, fall camp, and, and spent a day with the program around Mike Norvell, who was the head coach. Kenny Dillingham was on the staff. And Ryan Silverfield, the current coach, was on the staff. And Dan Lanning was the linebackers coach. And I sat in on a meeting with them. And as players are walking into this linebackers room, Dan Lanning's holding out his arms like this, like in a circle. And he says, everybody, drop your feelings into this bag because what we're <laughs> going to stay in that room is not to be taken personally, you know. And he's this was he was in his young 30s, then he's 37 now, but it was an energetic meeting. He wasn't just demeaning everybody, it was just a lot of energy 
Mm-hmm. And that comes through in everything he does from the way he recruits to the way he coaches. You know, we he's, I think, 19 and four at Oregon. Three of those losses have come by one score in which he went for a fourth down that would have basically kind of won the game and they didn't get it. So like he is a very aggressive guy. He knows how to lead at the highest level of college football because he saw it at Alabama. He saw it at Georgia. He's doing the same thing at Oregon. Now, the big question, two big questions about Dan Lanning in Oregon. One, does he want to leave? He's got Nike resources there. You got a lot there. They're in the Big Ten now. You don't got to worry about the Pac-12 and all that stuff. So there's a lot to like about what he's doing in Oregon. The second part, he has a $20 million buyout, which he just signed (laughs) earlier this year. And when you sign that contract that he got, and when you agree to a $20 million buyout, you generally do that if you're not planning to leave and you're Mm -hmm. trying to show that you're not leaving. Mm -hmm. However, Texas (laughs) A&M, if you're already spending $90 million to get rid of your coaches, what's another 20? What's another 10 for his salary? (laughs) This is probably going to cost more than... This is probably going to cost more than $100 million for Texas A&M to do all of this change. Now, that seems like a lot of money, but we also saw SMU a couple weeks ago announcing, hey, we just raised $100 million in a week because we're Mm -hmm. going to the ACC and we need some boosters Mm -hmm. to help. SMU has some big money boosters. Texas A&M has a whole lot more. So you can expect that they're going to be able to throw a whole lot of money at anybody. That's $20 million about for Dan Landing is probably doable. The question is, does <laughs> Dan Landing want to do it? Now, the name, one last name we'll talk about here, we'll wrap up soon here. The, a, a name I'm really curious to watch for this is Mike Norvell at Florida mm-hmm. State. He is a Texas native, and he has Florida State 10-0 competing for a national championship, potentially could make the college football playoff. And he's got a pretty good track record of turning around a mess that Jimbo Fisher left behind. (laughs) This is exactly what it it was. Jimbo Fisher, then two years of Willie Taggart, then Mike Norvell. But Jimbo at A&M, it was going down, you know, before he left. His last season there, they almost didn't make a bowl game. So Mike Norvell Mm -hmm. comes in, builds it up through the transfer portal, and they get in. uh, They're having this big year, obviously. And we've heard Florida State people all their administration saying we can't compete with the SEC. We can't compete with the Big Ten because of the money that they're going to be making over the next handful of years. Does Mike Norvell sit there and look at that and say, hey, do I need to get into the SEC? Do I need to get into the Big Ten? Because I'm at a school that we're having a great year, but we're not going to be able to compete long term with those schools. I think he's got a top five recruiting class this year right now. So like it's going very well. I'm just mm-hmm. curious if that's something he might be interested in. His buyout to leave is, I think, $6 million. What do you think about that? The interesting thing about that is I wonder if there would just be pause on A&M's an A&M side of it, of just going back to the same well you went last time, going back and hiring right. the Florida State coach. And I know that's silly to say, but I think perception matters in a lot of these things. The same reason why I said I don't think A&M would hire the UTSA coach because it's UTSA. Mm-hmm. I, I think the very same thing could come into play is, when you when you consider Mike Norvell is are you going to go hire the Florida State coach again? And they're totally different guys, and they run totally different programs. And all the things that Norvell has done has have been pretty impressive. Like you said, there was a time where we were talking about Mike Norvell. Wasn't there a Twitter Spaces or something a few years ago? The, fi- the fire, Mike, fire Norvell, Mike Norvell. The fi- Norvell. When, when, when he lost Travis Hunter to Deion Sanders yeah. at Jackson State. Yep. And to see and to see where that program is now, right here in college football playoff condition, and the way. The way they portaled, the way he rebuilt that roster, doing a lot of things that, oh, by the way, Jimbo Fisher was not doing the last few years. Jimbo didn't really use the portal very much until this year when they, they absolutely had to. Uh, yeah, I think I think he would make a lot of sense. Um, it's an it's another offensive guy, obviously, and so that that would be interesting to see, uh, you know, where that fits into this. But the question is, is it like you said, does he want to go? Does he want to leave? And and to what degree would this job be appealing because it is the the one thing is that they don't lack is they don't lack for resources. You're in the sec. So you're in a very secure space because your TV deal is done. You're, you're, you're going to have, you're going to be, you're near at or near the top in terms of revenue 
uh, for your school, you know, this per school payouts from each conference, the Big Ten, the SEC are going to pace everybody else on that front. So any job that comes open in those two conferences is coveted. And so A&M is going to be one of the most coveted for all the reasons I just listed earlier, because they have every other ingredient you need. Uh, so that would be an interesting one for sure. I just wonder if the perception would would end up giving some people pause on that. Yeah, and I, I'm looking through the comments right now. A lot of people have thoughts on Dan Lanning. Kirby Ranch says Lanning will not spend his career up north. Not that he's going to end up in College Station, but he'll be somewhere besides Eugene. Solard says, uh, or who, where was it? Uh, yeah, Solard says Lanning waiting on the Bama job. <laughs> Perhaps. I, I, I mean, Dan Lanning going to the trajectory that he's on is to end up at an Alabama or a Georgia type of program at some point, you know. Do you go to Texas A&M to do that? Do you do something else? I don't know. We'll see. You know, he he's he's in a good spot in Oregon. It's going to be very expensive to get him out. But again, if you're Texas A&M and you're spending $75 million to get rid of your coach, you're already so far out there that anything is possible. Truly anything is possible with this coaching hire. I want to stress that very much. You know, nobody saw Lincoln Riley going to USC. Nobody saw Brian Kelly going to LSU. It feels like it could be one of those paradigm shifting type of coaching changes so we will before we go how- before no. we go before yeah. we go i want to say one last thing kind of what I, I kind of alluded to this earlier but i think there's a lot of ways this could go right for texas a&m because i think we talk about we're talking so much about the right guy and getting the right guy and that's critical but i think when you see how much the program has crumbled despite its talent in the last few years I think it's clear that Jimbo Fisher's best days were way behind him. And I don't know that you has to be one perfect guy or two perfect guys that you have to land on to get to get this thing right. I think there's a lot of candidates out there that I think could really elevate this place. We, like Again, if they can hold on to some of the talent on hand. I think uh, when you look at some of the names we listed are guys that are doing the things in 2023 in college football that you have to be doing to winning that Jimbo Fisher was slow to do and slow to adapt to. So I think... I think there's a lot of different options here that could really work. And, and it, I think depending on how much talent they're able to hold on to in the portal, it will be really interesting to see what 2024 looks like for A&M and how quickly this thing turns around. Let me, let me wrap actually one other question, which we didn't, I mm-hmm. can't believe we didn't bring this up in this podcast or YouTube video, Texas. How much mm-hmm. of this has to do with Texas, not only coming into the SEC, but coming in with a pretty good team. Um, that is, you know, Texas A&M had a decade long head start on the SEC. They had all the advantages and all the things that came with that. And here we are, Texas is coming and it feels like A&M may have squandered all that, you know, potential that they had there. How much of this is because Texas is doing a really good job and seems to have a good coach? I, I don't think it's the majority of the reason by any stretch. I think the majority of the reason is you can just watch AM the last three years on the field, and I think that's your reason right there. But it is a factor 100% because this is their rival. They still do pay attention to what goes on in Austin, just like people in Austin pay attention to what's going on in College Station. It absolutely is a factor because – and I've had this conversation with a lot of people over the last four, three, four months before we knew how good Texas was going to be if Texas was going to play for a big 12 title or even a college football playoff and A&M was sitting here at seven and five or eight and four, are you, is A&M really going to be okay with just running it back one more year with Jimbo Fisher going in 2024? And there there's always been a yin and a yang to those two programs in nine, in the late 1990s, early two thousands when Mac Brown got to Texas and he started rising up and they started having some really good seasons 2002 rc slocum got fired at texas a&m then when kevin sumlin came to texas a&m 2012 and mac brown's teams at texas started to falter and they weren't reaching that reaching that level anymore a&m goes 20 and 6 in two years they get a heisman trophy winner and mac brown gets pushed out at texas and then jimbo fisher takes texas a&m to number five in the country and on the cusp of the playoff in 2020 and Tom Herman gets fired at Texas. The, these two programs, there's definitely a power struggle between the two of them for like the balance of power in the state and and for running the state, so to speak. And so I think that's important because I think AM realizes it has an opportunity here with the talent on the rush that's been assembled that 
you, like you said, you've kind of squandered some of that advantage, but maybe if you hire the right guy, you can, you can regain it back to a certain degree. And I think that's mm -hmm. part of what, and I think I'll, I'll say, I'll leave it with this to me last night, the Saturday night game against Mississippi state, watching them blow out Mississippi state 51 to 10, or 51 to 14, whatever the score was Mississippi state's not very good. We know that, but to watch them play like they did last night and to see that offense function like that with a third string quarterback who has not had a ton of reps, who they had to simplify the offense for and watch them run around like that. I think in many ways that was damning and indicting on Jimbo Fisher because you had these experienced quarterbacks or you had the five-star quarterback and the offense looked better with the third string guy, not to say the third string guy was better. He was, oh, he's not Connor Wigman is the best quarterback on that roster, but because this guy hasn't been coached that much yet, it looks better because it's simplified. You let the players play and you got out of the way. And so I've kind of got off on tangent there, but, but my point is, is that I think even with the win last night, you could see that the pieces are there and the talent is there. And te Texas is starting to assemble that talent. You look at Texas's roster two years ago when Steve Sarkeesian got there, it did not look like AM's roster, not even close. And now you look at it and now it looks a lot closer to AM's roster than it did two years ago. And this, that rivalry matters. And that, that game is going to happen next year in 2024. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be the biggest game. It's going to be the hottest ticket. And both of those programs are going to win, want to win that one badly. And Texas A&M is going to want to go in with, with their best shot. And that, I think they've deemed that their best shot is not with Jimbo Fisher. It's with making a change and going to someone else. So uh, is it a factor? Absolutely. Is it the factor? No. But but it absolutely yeah. is a little bit of something that happens in the Lone Star State here. Yeah, we will see. that this. You know, It's a late start to the coaching carousel for everybody. Uh, this will wrap up pretty quickly, You know, less than a month. I would imagine there's a new coach in place. Conference championship games the first weekend of December. Another factor overall, this which we can't predict, is if a team is in or going to the college football playoff, they may not go to the Texas A&M job. You know, if 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 Kalen DeBoer, or Dan Lanning, or Mike Norvell has their team set to go to the playoff, they may say no to A&M because we saw Luke Fickle do the same thing to Notre Dame a couple of years ago. He, he, he Cincinnati had a chance to go to the playoff. Didn't do it. They went and hired Marcus Freeman. It's another factor to watch as well. So that's going to wrap it up here. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Jimbo Fisher is out at Texas A&M. Make sure you're subscribing to the Until Saturday YouTube channel and the podcast. We will have a lot more on this in the coming days, as well as other coaching carousel news that is coming out as well. Full loaded shows this week. For Sam, this is Chris. Thank you very much for joining us.